we try to obey the Lord this morning and preach to you what God has laid upon our heart. Of course, our mind has been focused on revival for the last few weeks, and I, I trust sincerely that you've been praying and seeking the face of God and doing what the Scripture says, because only through that will we have revival, only through that. And we have Scripture here where Solomon had uh, built the temple of the Lord, uh, the previous chapter, he had dedicated the temple unto the Lord in prayer. And chapter number, si number 6 uh, closes with his prayer of dedication of the temple. And now chapter number 7 brings us uh, a verse that is used more for revival uh, stirrings and preachings and movings uh, probably than any other verse in Scripture. And... Uh, it's by the design of God that this verse is here, I certainly believe. But it has, it has a formula in it for revival. It tells us what we need to do to have revival. How many of you want revival? Raise your hand. Amen. While you raise your hand, everybody stand while we read. Amen. Stand while we read a few verses in 2 Chronicles chapter number 7. 2 Chronicles chapter number 7. 2 Chronicles chapter number 7. I'll begin reading with verse number 1. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. You notice that. The glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, for he, is, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifice before the Lord, and King Solomon offered sacrifice. Let, listen to the, to the numbers of these sacrifices. And King Solomon offered a sacrifice of twenty and two thousand oxen and a hundred and twenty thousand sheep. So the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. And the priests waited on their offices, the Levites also, with the instruments of music of the Lord, which David the king had made to praise the Lord, because his mercy endureth forever. When David praised by their ministry and the priests sounded trumpets, before them, and all Israel stood. Moreover, moreover Solomon, Solomon hallowed the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord, for there he offered burnt offerings and the fat of the peace offerings, because the brazen altar which Solomon had made was not able to receive the burnt offerings, <coughs> excuse me, and the meat offerings and the fat. Also, at the same time, Solomon kept the feast seven days. And all Israel with him, a very great congregation from the entry in of Hamath unto the river of Egypt. And in the eighth day they made a solemn assembly, for they kept the dedication of the altar seven days, and the feast seven days. And on the three and twentieth day of the seventh month he sent the people away into their tents, glad and merry in their heart, for the goodness that the Lord had shown unto David and to Solomon and to Israel his people. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the uh, king's house and all that King Solomon heart to make in the house of the Lord. And in his own house he prosperously effected. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have, cho I have heard thy prayer, and I have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I pen, pet, send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Father, we thank you for the word of God. Bless it, I pray. Help us to rightly divide the word of truth. And God, give us words of wisdom. Lord, that we might... Stir people, God, with thy word this morning. I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would move around this church. Lord, move behind this pulpit. Lord, take up your place here, God, that the word of God might be proclaimed. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Help, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 
We have in this verse of Scripture, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, I believe we have here the great promise of the Scripture concerning revival. Uh, we live in a land that is desperate for a move of God. Uh, you look around, every, every corner of the United States is, is desperately in need of a move of the Holy Spirit of God. We've come a long way backward since our founding fathers founded this great nation. We've moved a long way uh, back from what God intended, I believe, our nation to be. Yet we've become a nation of, of uh, unbelievers. We've become a nation of God-haters. We've become a nation that knows not God. Now we sat in a little corner of North Carolina, in the mountains, in the hills, on a ridge top. I don't know, over 65 people here this morning, 60, 65, something like that. And you say, how in the world can we make a difference? Well, I'm going to tell you how we make a difference. We already make a difference. By our presence, by your presence at the house of the Lord, you are making a difference. You are showing your support for the house of God and for the things of God. And you're showing your desire, I believe, that God reveal himself to us in a mighty way. A friend, I want revival as bad, badly as I've ever wanted revival in my life, I do believe. I want to see God move. I, I searched my heart like I, I sat alone for a long time. My wife was at work, and I'm sitting there alone a long time thinking, Dear God, will you ever send revival to our churches again? God, will you ever move upon our churches again? And my heart breaks because... We, we don't see folks saved in the house of God any longer because we a, long, a lot of times we see churches that are dead and that are not have no life about them and barely hanging on for dear life. Oh, my friend, today we need revival in the worst sort of way. Now, relatively, according to all that I understand and hear about churches in our area, we're one of the ones that's doing good. Amen. And I say, praise the Lord, to God be the glory. It's all Him, amen, it's all Him. But I believe you said in your heart and you raised your hand a while ago, we do need revival and we want it, amen. So I'm going to give you real quickly the, the, the uh, promise of a revival, I believe, is shown in these verses. The greatest thing, I believe, that can happen in America today, in Madison County today, on Gabriel's Creek today is revival. Now you say, well, preacher, we need to go to war and, and uh, tear some people up and, and uh, protect our liberty. We need all that, but we need first, we need God. Amen. Our country be far better off turning to God than it will anything else that we can think to turn. God will take care of us. God will fight our battles. If America would get right with God, God would fight the battles for her. Amen. He did for Israel. He would do it for us. And will. But listen, I can't do nothing about the millions of people in America that have gone back on God. I can't do anything about you sitting before thee this morning that your heart may not be dedicated to the Lord. The only person I can do something about is this one right here behind this pulpit. So this is very personal today to me. This message is very personal to me because I am part of this verse of Scripture as well as you are a part of these verses of Scripture. If we follow the formula and if we do the things and we follow the recipe that is outlined in these passages of Scripture, then you and I will have revival. Now, how many of you like to cook and bake? Anybody besides me? Now, preacher, are you crazy? No, I like it. Amen. That's why I look like I do, because I like it. I tried something new in the crock pot today. I looked at this, I looked at that, and I had this, and I had that, and now I'm going to see what it is when I get home. If it hadn't burnt the house down, it might be all right. Or if it hadn't burnt up and smoked the house up, it'll probably be good. But listen to me. I did that, but I did it by recipe. Have you ever baked a cake and left the eggs out? Well, that makes a mess. You, lots of things you do wrong. If you don't follow the recipe, it ain't going to turn out right. 
But sometimes if I'm making a, if I'm making a cake, I, yeah, man, I sound like a, well, anyway. Sometimes if I'm making a cake and the box calls for two eggs, if I'm making a box cake, I put three. Sometimes I put four. I always add a little bit extra because it always adds a little bit to the cake. Amen. Listen, I need a move of God. If I'm making mashed potatoes and it says use a half a stick of butter, don't give me no margarine business, buddy. Give me butter. I put a whole stick in that mashed potato. Yeah. Good, good, though, ain't they? Y'all eat them a lot when you're here at fellowship. Y'all eat them if you can, you know. They're pretty good. You like them because never taking them back. Probably didn't even know I'm the one at making them. My wife does most of the few things that I do. And that peanut butter pie that I make, I've got a recipe for it, but I, it ne I never follow the recipe to the letter. If it says half a thing of cream cheese, I use a whole one. It says a half a, a cup of peanut butter, I use a whole cup. Hey man, now I'm starving you to death. But I'm telling you, I do this. If I left out the peanut butter, it wouldn't be no good to most folks because it's a peanut butter pie. Hello. Leave the butter out of the potatoes and they taste kind of bland. You can, you can eat them, but they're just not as good for most people. Now, there's some folks that I, there's one person in particular, if I'm making mashed potatoes, I try to get some out for anything so they can have some of them and they like them too. Amen. But listen, I'll tell you something. Everything by recipe, as far as cooking goes, is much better if you follow the recipe or add a little to it. Now, God has provided for us in the Scripture a recipe to have revival. And you can't have it if you leave it out. You've got to have the recipe. You've got to do what the Bible says in order for Him to bless you in order for him to help you, in order for you to have a move of God, amen, you got to follow the recipe for it to turn out right. Now, we start next Sunday. We start for five, night, five meetings. Five meetings. And go through Wednesday night. Now look, if you're here today, please be here for revival. Unless you're providentially hit. Oh, by the way, let me explain to you what providentially hindered is, okay? I hear that a lot. But here's what providentially, are y'all ready for this? Now somebody get mad at me, but I'm just going to tell you what I learned this. This is something, one thing I learned, what providentially hindered means. It means when you're standing before the judgment seat of Christ and the Lord says you didn't go to revival meeting this week, and what is your reason? And God already knows but providentially hindered is any excuse that will stand right with God when you're standing before him at the judgment seat of Christ. Well, Lord, I didn't go because my left big toe had an ingrown toenail. <laughs> well, did you go to work the next day? Yeah, I had to go to work. I had to make money. I had to pay my bills. It would be much better off for you to skip work and go to church and I'll take care of the bills. Amen. Lord, I've had terrible allergies. <laughs> Talk to Noah about a flood. Man, I get up and I breathe and I sniff and I'm, you know, can't take medicine because it makes me crazy. And No, I ain't had none this morning either, by the way. It makes me sleepy. And if it don't do none of that, it don't, make, don't do nothing to me, so I don't take it. So I get up, you know, and no matter what's going on, guess who goes to work? Amen, me. But God takes care of me, Amen. But if you can stand before God with your excuse for not coming to revival and it'll hold up before God, you're providentially hindered. If it won't, you're not. And you'll lose reward for that reason. Same way as missing church. If you can, if, if whatever excuse you've got for not going to church, boy, I'm in trouble, and that's all right. Amen. If, if, if whatever reason you've got for not going to church will stand before God, amen, you're, it's all right. He said, well, preacher, I go on vacation. Well, okay. I believe, the Lord, I believe the Lord wants us to go on vacation from time to time. As long as we don't vacation from him, we do all right. But it don't happen every other weekend. <coughs> hey, listen, friend, if my, if my people, 
which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my faith. So if you're here and you want revival, amen, be here and let you give God a chance, amen. Give God a chance to stir you and to move you and God will bless you. Now I'm finished meddling and I'm going to preach the rest of the message, amen. I believe you understand what providentially hindered is, but here we go, amen. These seven things I believe in the word of God are a recipe for Revival. First of all, we see that uh, God is willing and waiting and longing to give us revival. I believe it's got something God wants to do for me. I believe it's something that God wants to do for you and send you revival. God wants us to be stirred for Him. God wants us to be a good mouthpiece for Him. God wants us to, to follow Him and do His will. So it's something that God wants. He says that he's, he, he promised that he would heal our land. He promised that he, if we met the conditions that he would send revival. And I believe God wants to do it more than we want it. Amen. I believe God desires to stir us up sometimes more than we want it. And I want it and I want it bad. You know why? Because I look back at the days when of old, you say you shouldn't live. I'm not living back there. I'm just telling you, if God did it then, God can do it now. Amen? And I look back at the days when God stirred and God moved. And friend, I want that badly. I was talking to a fellow the other day, and, and that he was telling about their... Boy, I, let me tell you, time out a minute. <clears throat> I'm proud of Gables Creek Baptist Church. I love you folks. I'm proud of you. And this fellow telling me, Church that I know well how that their numbers had dropped down to nothing and and about half of what they used to be and and I'm sitting there and I know the church well and I I'm sitting there and and, and I said well we're growing some amen we're doing pretty good and uh, and I'm thinking praise the Lord amen we ain't backing up we may not be going to, we may be pushing uphill and we be going a little slow. But hallelujah, we're not backing up. Amen. So I'm proud of the church, and I appreciate you. And God bless you. If anybody can have revival, I believe it'll be Gabriel's Creek. Amen. Time back in. Talked to a young lady yesterday. She called and said, your folks was down here at hospice serving us a meal. I worked with her. And she said, man, I appreciate them doing that. She said, it's such a blessing. They just put her father-in-law in there the day before and she said, it's such a blessing. I, I thank you for that. Amen. The, the church is doing pretty good, but we still need revival. Amen. We still need stirring. We still need a movement of God. And God's waiting right there. I believe he's waiting right now to pour it out upon us. If we'll just say, Lord, I'll do what you want. Send revival. Now, this is conditional. Number two, revival is conditional. That little word, if. You say, well, I, I'd have a million dollars if I'd have saved while I was a baby. You might say, well, I would have killed a deer if I'd have seen one. See, there's conditions to everything you do. There's a condition for revival. The condition is if. Now, who is revival for? I've said many times in the last couple of weeks, revival is not for a lost man. Revival is not for a lost man. I started to preach a message this morning. It's the way God led me because I had something else on my mind. I, I started to pe preach a message, are you full of sap? <laughs> and I got to thinking about it. this is the fall of the year, and I'm not going to ruin the message because I may preach it to you later. But this is the fall of the year when the sap starts going down. Yeah. Now them trees out there are have got limbs on them. Them limbs are going to lose their leaves and it's going to look dead. But it's still alive. The sap just ain't in them. Because the sap goes down in the ground. But you look at a pine tree. 
It's evergreen all the time, always full of life. When the snow and the wind and the rain and the storm is blowing on it, it's still just as green as it can be because why? It's still full of sap. It's still got some, it's still got some grow in it. It's got some life in it. Amen. God wants to bless us. God wants to help us. God's willing to bestow revival upon us if my people. Salvation is not for a or, or salvation is for a lost man, but revival is for a saved man. You can't revive something that's dead. I can go out here in the woods and I can get a, a dead lot. And I can put it in the ground and I can fertilize it. And it'll still be dead. You say, well, locusts grow after it's been cut. Yeah, but it ain't dead yet. It's still alive. It's still got some life in it. But an old dead oak tree you lay it out in the ground after it's been laying there and it's dead and dried up and stick it up in the ground, fertilize it, water it, and it's still dead. You can't do anything with something that's dead. You can't revive it. But come next spring, them, the sap will start rising and them, them uh, dead looking trees out there and the buds will start putting out and the green will start coming out and friend, you can see that it has some life about it. It's been revived, amen. If my people, God's people, you and me, God's people, if we will do a couple of things, God will send us revival. It's content, conditional upon God's people. And number one, the Bible tells us this, if my people, you and me, which are called by my name, you and I are called, we're all under conviction. We all knew that we were lost. The Holy Spirit of God told us that. We called on the Lord and God called back and said, I'm, I'll save you if you'll just turn to me. If my people, which are called by my name, shall, number one, humble themselves. We're living in a day when everybody's so proud. Everybody's so proud. You can't find no humbleness is something. Humility is something that is about being stricken from our natures. There's a lot of things that will knock the pride right out of you. I know several. I've got several examples of people that have had the pride knocked out of them, and and not being able to give you one without a. Something real personal. I know a fellow the other while back that was driving down the road and paying no attention to what he was doing and brand new car and plowed into the back of another vehicle. So proud of that car, yet now it can't be because it's been taken away. That's something knock the humility into you, wouldn't it? That'd humble you. Can you think of other things in your life that will humble you? Well, I'll tell you what, no matter how proud you are, you wake up in the middle of the night with a kidney stone attack and you'll be humbled right quick. You'll be begging the Lord to do anything. You, you'll tell him you'll do anything if he'll just stop the pain. No matter how proud you are, there's things that will humble you and I'm telling you, if God's people see revival, we must humble ourselves before God. We must admit to him that we're just a sinful people in need of a move of God, a stirring of God, that he might revive us and cause us, amen, to re why? To rejoice in the Lord. We walk around with much too long. Amen, buddy. Amen. He's helping me. Jack back there helping me. Hey, we ought to be happy in the Lord. These long-faced Christians, they just don't do it for me no more. Brother Harold Ray said they look like a, like a long-faced mule. And I got to thinking about that. Have you ever looked at a long-faced mule? Boy, that's the most unhappy-looking critter you've ever seen in your life. All the time. Let me tell you something, friend. I don't want to be that. I want to be happy. I want to rejoice in the Lord. If my people, me, you, shall do one thing, humble themselves 
And you, when you come before God, you got to come, honey. You can't come before him. God, this is me. You know me. I'll give you myself for any time. <clears throat> I'm Pastor Gary Cody. I pastor the great Gable Creek Baptist Church. Last part of that's right. First part of it makes no difference. <laughs> and Lord, you know me. I pastor the great Gable Creek Baptist Church. Now, Lord, you must hear me because I pastor the church. <laughs> now, is that not pride? When I come before the God of heaven, I must come before him like this. Dear God in heaven, Lord, I know that I'm worthless. God, I keep Pastor Gables Creek Baptist Church except you help me. Lord, I need your help. God bless my people. Lord, will you hear me? God, I need a help from God. I need the power of God. Dear Jesus, will you help me? Humble before God. Listen, if you ever have revival, you're going to have to humble yourself from God, before God and realize we're nothing but sinners saved in the grace of God. If it wasn't for God, we'd go to hell without Him. We must humble ourselves before God. And you come before God and you humbly bow yourself before Him and you pray. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and pray and pray and I've been preaching on prayer for a good number of weeks. And I've been teaching about prayer for a good number of weeks. But I'm telling you, if we want revival, it'll come when we pray and call out to God and ask Him and desire Him that He send us revival. Humble ourselves and pray. Now, what's the difference between praying and seeking His face? We seek His face. You, look, you think of the face of God. What do you think of the glory of God? Moses was on the mountain and he desired to see God and, 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 and uh, God told him, he said, you, you hide your face and I'll show you my hinder parts. I'll just show you the back of me. And Moses couldn't even hardly handle that. But he saw he came shining with the glory of God. Let me tell you something, folks. If we humble ourselves and pray and seek the glory of God, seek the face of God and His glory, I'm telling you, when we get that, friend, it's going to radiate off of you and I. We should be reflections of God. And if, if we have that about us, then the, then the world and others are going to see, man, there's something different about that person. He was grumpy the other day, but he got back from church and now he's happy. Something happened to him when he went to the house of God. Amen. I'm kind of enjoying myself. Some of you don't look like you're enjoying this too much. But amen. I'm looking for a move of God. I'm looking for a stir of God. And if you want it, you can have it. Just humble yourself before God. Pray. Seek his glory. Now here's where most people stop with this verse because they don't want to get the rest of the verse. And turn from your wicked ways. My people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. You say, now preacher, I do some things that I don't know if it's exactly right or not. Amen. Turn from your wicked ways. Well, preacher, I've got some habits that I know God ain't well pleased with it. Turn from your wicked ways. Well, preacher, I watch some things on TV that I know I shouldn't watch. Turn from your wicked ways. Well, preacher, I do some things on the Internet that I know is not right. Turn from your wicked ways. Well, preacher, I like to have a little, I like to smoke a little joint once in a while. Turn from your wicked ways. I like to, I like to drink a little bit socially. Turn from your wicked ways. I have no idea if anybody does any of those things, but I'm telling you, if we will do what the Bible says, God will send revival. You've got to turn from your wicked way. Now, what is a wicked way? If it goes against the Word of God, it's a wicked way. If it goes against the things that the Bible, that the Bible teaches, it's a wicked way. Turn from your wicked way. 
Well, there's where you lose most people because most people don't want revival bad enough to do that. They, don't, they want to hang on to those little pet. Listen, if you'll empty yourself b before God and God fills you with his spirit, you'll never want those wicked ways again. Hallelujah. Amen. Because then the Bible says, do all these things. Pray, seek the face of God, humble yourselves, turn from your wicked ways. Another condition. Then, and only then, will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Only then. And I believe America's greatest need today is to turn from their wicked ways. But I believe that every individual, there's something there that you must turn from. Amen. And if God ever sends you revival, Lord, help us. God, help us. Help me. Lord, help me that I turn from the wicked ways. You say, preacher, you don't have wicked ways. Oh, oh my. I, I go to, I tell you a list of things that I battle all the time that if I don't, if I don't battle it and if I don't turn from it, I'll have some wicked ways. Most of the time it happens in an automobile. I can get more backslid in an automobile than I can anything I do. I think most preachers are that way because I talk to them and they get just as mad as I do when, they, when people drive like idiots in the, in, on the highway. Most cars today are made without signal lights that work, I'm sure of. I don't give my signal if ain't nobody behind me. My wife says, why don't you give me signal? I'm saving the light bulbs, okay? But if I... But if I'm going down a highway and I need to get over, I give them a signal. You know why? I want that person back there to know I'm coming over. And you know what they do most of the time? Speed up. It makes me madder. And in most time I'm trying to get over, somebody's within a foot of my bumper and I can read, I can read the, the <coughs> their uh, whatever they got hanging up on the of their car, I'd read what it says. They're falling too close. I don't know what to do. No, I don't hit my brakes. I quit that a long time ago. I just take my foot off the gas. And then they go mild, and then they you look in your rear view mirror, and they're calling you everything in the world. I was driving in a parking lot the other day. Now, I'm telling you, I tell you all this stuff because I know this stuff can't happen and I have revival. Even this little stuff I got to get rid of. I was driving in a park, in the parking lot, in a parking lot. There was a car coming out of the parking lot that was parked in the way. I'm going in the parking lot. I pull in the parking lot. A truck tries to come around the car. He can't because I'm coming in the parking lot. He's trying to pass the parked car. And he's mouthing at me. Well, there's room for me to get by. And I just stopped. I thought maybe he's going to tell me to have a good day. I rolled down my window. He didn't roll down his window. And he was mouthing some of the awfulest obscenities I've ever seen lip sync in my life. And he says to me, I'm trying to get out. I said, buddy, I'm just trying to get in. I'm going in the parking lot. I'm getting out of the road. He's coming out of the parking lot, and he wants to mouth at me. So before the flesh totally takes over, I drive on and look in my rearview mirror, and he's like, I'm going in the parking lot. He's coming out. The car's in his lane. I'm in the right lane. And he wants to bother me. You say, I preach that wouldn't bother me. Well, it does me. See, I've got some little quirks that bother me and things that I battle with the flesh that you may never not. You've got things that bother you and that you deal with in the flesh that may not bother me. But we got to get rid of those things and walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. Are you willing to do whatever it takes to have revival? Everybody bow your head just a minute. I'm through.
And let me ask you today, are you willing to do what it takes to have revival? If you are, raise your hand. We prayed, amen, most every hand in the building. If that many hands will do what God says, we can have revival. 